Ray stood up, aimed his face exactly at where I was, and yelled, third trombone, too goddamn loud. Welcome to the Gig Boss Podcast, a show about music industry and artistry. I'm Adam Meckler, and it's my mission to get you the tools to have a thriving career in music. And today, we've got Mike Christensen on the show, hailing from the bustling metropolis of Fargo, North Dakota, Mike found his way into Ray Charles' band. And he stayed there for two years before moving to New York City, playing on Broadway, and playing with some of my most favorite musicians in the world, including Maria Schneider, John Hollenbeck, and Fred Hirsch. Mike is an awesome storyteller, and he has some great stories about his time with Ray and his time in New York City. Mike and I both now work at Michigan Technological University, so this is one of those rare episodes where I get to be in the same room as the artist that I'm talking to. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see us in my office. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Mike Christensen. Thanks for hanging with me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Cool. Hey, uh, so the first time I was, I guess, encountered the Christensen family, the lore of like the brass players and the Christensen family was Ryan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, who's your nephew? Is that right? You Uncle Mike to he's, him, or he's how is my that? Cousin's son. Oh, cousin's son. Okay. So I don't know what, what you call that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he told me. I, th- I think it was him that said, like, "Oh yeah, my family came over on the boat as a brass band." You know. <laughs> so Maybe like, I don't so, know. <laughs> so what's your like? Tell me a little bit about your your history, like coming from North Dakota and yeah. you know, having lots of brass players in your family. Yeah, my uh, turns out when when we asked. Um, you know, whenever we got around to asking, like, well, you know, uh, I, I saw some pictures of my grandfather and my great grandfather, but I never met either of them. I, I, they both had passed away by the time I was born. So I never, I mean, maybe they, they saw me, but like, I, I, you know, maybe I was three months old or something and saw one of them saw me or something, but, yeah, yeah. but I had no physical interaction ever with those people. Um, and, it, and no one necessarily told me right away that um they had been band directors too both of my grandfather and my great grandfather directed like the town band of their town and wow. and these towns were sometimes like um close to each other in the middle of nowhere like way up near the top of North Dakota yeah um is where they is Pemina was the name of the town and it had like i don't know the population was maybe like 460 people or something mm. like that and uh, so, like, when my dad wanted to learn an instrument, um, they said, well, you have to pick one of these two because that's what the town band needs. They didn't have a school band. Yeah. They had a town band. So, like, when he decided to pick tuba over whatever the other choice was, um, they found him a tuba, and he sat next to, I don't know, the barber in town or whatever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so like he didn't get um, maybe the greatest information about how to play something. Yeah, um, and uh, but that's 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 when he that's how he started playing uh, in any kind of a group was in the town band in Pembina, North Dakota. Um, and when he went to college at University of North Dakota, which was you know one of the best thing play places you could go during that time he was salty um because he his band director didn't know anything about telling him how to play better either Hmm. like he didn't really understand brass instruments particularly not giant brass instruments yeah and so there was no this is before there was a single professor of tuba in the united states in no there were no universities that had one right um so I think Harvey Phillips was the guy's name who became the first one, and it was I think at Indiana University or someplace like that, and he was a you know legitimate, brilliant tuba player, and one of the colleges was like, well we should hire that person, <laughs> <You know>? yeah, <laughs> and then once that happened, it sort of like opened the floodgates. But like my dad had already graduated by the time, and he and his lessons with the band director were that he would bring in his parts for the band pieces. And play him on his sousaphone hmm. in the office of the band director, and and my dad was just you know I'm sure I don't know if he said anything out loud but like he definitely 
crabbed about it when I asked him like years later. He's like, yeah, that was horrible. It was really like I learned nothing. You yeah. Know, like I already, you know. So anyway, um, he figured out that if he could get a job. That, so this is what a lot of people in those remote areas and even like Fargo, which was the lar- has always been the largest city in North Dakota it's, it, and still is. Um, it still has a lot of small town behaviors even now, you know? Yeah. And so, um, one of the things that was almost completely ubiquitous was that, um, all of the older musicians I worked with were some, were mostly like music educators and, um, and they, they, th- I think they entered that because they liked music and they were pretty sure they would enjoy the job of teaching and it would give them a, an actual paycheck that they could raise their family with. Yeah. And, and so, like, I knew all these band directors of various, you know, elementary band directors, middle schools, high schools. I knew all, the, like, even some college professors because I took lessons from a couple of those people. Um, yeah. So, I mean... It, in a way, it was kind of nice. It was a place to grow up where there were a lot of helpful, good musicians who were giving you good advice and, you know, uh, encouraging you almost all the time. Like no one, there wasn't really, there really, it didn't feel to me like there was a lot of competition or any rivalries or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Like if you wanted to play, you probably got to play. You know, yeah. wherever it was. I mean, if you if you then maybe if you demonstrated that you really probably shouldn't play, then maybe they'd take you aside. <laughs> but not in public. Like they would, you know, like <laughs> yeah, something like that. So it was kind of a caring environment. Um, and man, you know, both of the I give super credit to both of my grandmas who were both really good piano players and organists in hmm. their church. And um, anytime we'd visit each of those, no matter which one it was, we'd go to visit it and they'd just kind of rip my, one of my grandmothers could play like stride, like Fats Waller. Yeah, cool. <laughs> she could totally do that. Um, and then, uh, but she could also play all the church hymns and whatever. And then my other, uh, my dad's mom. She could play, she could read everything out of the Reader's Digest compendium of like popular songs. She like, yep. she just sight read it, nail it. So you're so, just around music all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so did you think I'm going to be a band director or did you no. think I want to play? No. Well, I, I, there was a time when I realized it was a job. And when I was thinking about it in those terms, um, I definitely kept it in my head that, that, that um, it would be a job. But my dad didn't necessarily encourage me to do it. And first of all, he so, – so one of the things that happened was so my, my older sister um, was, a, was, like her grandmother's, uh, a brilliant piano player. Hmm. And, um, and like when my dad when, – when my older sister was in high school and they ran – they couldn't find a bassoon player, he just said – can you learn how to play this? She's like, sure. <laughs> I can now play the bassoon. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of thing. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, uh, shoot. I don't know where I was going there. Um, but, uh, so it was, oh, so I understood the reason I asked to stop taking piano lessons and my, my sister studied with the same person and she did everything this teacher said. And and I already, I, in retrospect, I think what I was doing was realizing that the piano, I like to say it's the easiest instrument in the world to play. And of course, everyone who's taken piano lessons gets angry about that. I was like, well, my cat can get a sound out of this thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So don't tell me yeah. it's difficult. <laughs> when you're coming from a brass player <laughs> side, I mean, that's... <laughs> Or yeah. even like, you know, fiddle. Sure. I mean, like, where's the frets, man? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's some, there's some challenges there. Um, so, so, uh, I think that in retrospect, I'd like to give myself credit because I, maybe I can ever all the, everyone who could have, you know, t- told me I'm full of it has may, p- maybe passed on, but, but, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but I think I saw that you could just goof around on the piano, like to your heart's content. Yeah. And I, that's what I wanted to do. And I, and I liked that idea. We had a piano in the house, obviously, and, and everywhere we visited, there was a piano. And so, um, and I did end up taking some lessons. Uh, my parents talked me into it. And, um, uh, and the person that they found was good. It was like not strict or demeaning or yeah. really rough, like, and figured out like, that I actually enjoyed playing some of the classical stuff that was fairly easy to play, you know, for a really good piano player. Um, and I enjoyed it because I was like, wow, Bach, woohoo, you know, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. like the harmony and the, the, the you know, the um, suspensions and, and yeah. you know, all kinds of beautiful stuff there. Uh, and so one of the things my dad had said was, well, um, if, and then when I finally said I'd like to get better at the piano, because I think I can see now, I don't know how old I was, like a teenager and then, I could see how piano would be useful to like learning certain things. Yeah. And he said, well, I would, my mother encouraged me to just play out of the hymnal, you know, and any hymnal, doesn't matter even what congregation it is. Yeah. You reading know, four parts four or parts. reading the, yeah. yeah. Four parts. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and just, because there's they're often just sort of chords and that's kind of mostly what it is. There's not a lot of necessarily moving lines and some of that stuff. And yep. it's a good way to hear nice harmonies. And so, I mean, I, I, I ended up becoming familiar with the piano and then, uh, we had, uh, I lived, my uncle came and lived with me. He, he was, uh, my grand, my mom's mom's son, and uh, mm -hmm. he was a great good musician himself, and he ended up playing horn in the West Point band for like 24 years. But what wow. he was really trying to do the entire time was take lessons from New York jazz pianists, because uh, he was not that far away from New York. The, the, ba the bass uh, is not a long drive. It's like a 90-minute drive, maybe. Yep. So he would come into New York, take lessons with some of the, some of the people there. Um, so he's a really fine pianist himself, an organist, and whatever. So when did you like when when did it become? I want to get out to the East Coast. I want to be in oh, New York. Almost and play. immediately. Yeah. I mean, like, like like one and so one of the guy that was considered the most um, knowledgeable, uh, um, like had lived through the most stuff and was the best musician in town was a piano player, and he was also the piano tuner. Hmm. I mean, you could maybe ask someone else to tune it, but you were an idiot if you did because he was <laughs> really good at it. Um, and um, and he, his day job, he worked, he had the what sounds like the best job ever, you know, like day job you could possibly dream up. It was called the North Dakota Job Service. They used to have a whole, a whole uh, entity that was trying to find anyone that wanted one a job. Yeah. That's all his, he did. Yeah. Um, anyway... So uh, that guy, when he, I don't know how old I was when he asked me, but, but he said, so what do you think you want to do? You know, you know he had heard me play and he knew I had some, you know, idea of what I was doing. Yeah. And, and um, he, but one time he just laid it out and he said, so what, uh, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to um, go on. So in, as a kid in Fargo, I saw every single one of the bands. They came, all of them came through Fargo hmm. in my lifetime. Because like they're, when I, they're when going I was to like a young kid, Minneapolis and then trying to maybe, get. Yeah. yeah. Like it's a big long interstate through there. You can yep. get from, you know, Minnesota to Wyoming or wherever it is you're headed. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw Thad Jones and I saw, um, you know, Stan Kenton, Woody Herman, Buddy Rich, yep. Maynard, I don't know, all of it. Fat, fat, and Mel came, yeah. you know. Man. Toshiko. I mean, like, all these bands came to my town, and yeah. I s went and saw every single one of them. And I just, every time I'd see one of those bands, I was like, oh, that'd be fun to be in one of those bands. Boy, in the trombone section, that'd be amazing, you know. Yep. And so I thought, okay. But then, you know, I didn't really understand how you got into one, you know. So I didn't know. I just said, well, that looks great. And so this guy... The mentor, the pianist, he he knew, you know, more about that kind of thing. And so one time he just said, you know, do you want? And I said, well, I'd like to be in a big band. He said, well, um, and are you thinking of going like maybe to New York or L.A.? Those are your two 
like biggest choices. I mean, there's a lot of work in each of those places, but it's not necessarily easy to get it at all. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and I said, yeah, I'd like to go to New York. And, and, um, and he said, he said, and, and then he said, well, how, wait, how old are you? And I said, um, 16, you know, <laughs> he said, well, you should go now. And I just went like, what? <laughs> it freaked me out, you know. And, You're still and, in high school. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yep. Um, um, and I freaked it. I freaked out because I, I wasn't thinking of it at all. Like that. And, and his and his reply was, well, if you move now, in two years, you'll be 18 and you'll have learned a whole bunch, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. You'll be and, ahead of it. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah, I don't, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, but he later, uh, so um, there was a McDonald's corporation started an all American marching band mm. and they put it in the Macy's parade. And you could be in that band if you were nominated by, I guess, your band director or something like that. Um, and then I don't know if you had to play, submit a little something or other of playing, maybe like I would hope so, but I don't really remember. Yeah. So I got into that. And then from within that, they formed, uh, well, I shouldn't say from within that I might've made the, the giant band because I could play jazz. Um, and so like Chris Bodie was a member of this. This is the very first one of these things. Wow. And so like I, he was in that band. Um, Do you remember meeting him, talking to him at yeah, all? Yeah, totally. Uh, that's nuts. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> anyway, so we did that, and then we did some other gigs. We played at the Orange Bowl. We, When we were in New York, we did the Macy's Parade, obviously, but we went into Radio City Music Hall and recorded ourselves. And the guy that they picked to lead it was a, a guy who had been in, like, he, he was a, an, an instructor at Rutgers. It's a beautiful, beautiful human being and a great musician um but he wasn't commercial enough for the people that were overlooking yeah the whole thing. i'm trying to think of his name he was in like mingus's band or something like that. wow um or, or 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 one of the bands that was kind of like that that was like almost like almost entirely black people um who were yeah. doing some fairly modern stuff yeah um but he understood that like he didn't make us necessarily play too much of that um but we loved it. It was a, it was really a blast doing that. Mm. And uh, so then I guess that made me. So then I had one of the things they they had us do in New York was get on a bus and they took a tour of the city. And the person who talked about it, um, just she said like really interesting things. She's like, well, so this part of the town now used to be like a really swanky place, but like this kind of happens in New York and it's cyclical. Is like uh, eventually. <laughs> people won't be able to afford to live there. And so the rents are going to go down. Yeah. And then that's all going to shift to some other part of town, yeah. you know, where the new swank place will be. And I was like, oh, okay. So that just sort of helped me, like, uh, imagine being in New York. Yep, yep. Um, and, and having, you know, like, walked outside in a parade with millions of people or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought, well, I'm alive. I lived through that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, I found out that my... First trombone teacher in northern Colorado who had been on Stan Kenton's band and Woody Herman's band and played principal trump trombone in the Denver Symphony he was a very well rounded player and he hmm. tried to get us to all be the same, you know, which was great. I, th I thought he did a good job. Um, he found out um, some places where you could send a cassette tape to one of those road bands, like Glenn Miller's band or, yeah, or yeah. whatever. Buddy Rich, uh, Stan Kenton, you know, Woody Herman, I think, was still playing then. So I sent, I made a tape in my basement um, with like an Abersold, maybe, uh, backing me up. Um, and I sent it to all, all those places. And I got two calls back. And uh, one was from uh, the Tommy Dorsey band, I think it was. Yeah. And the other one was from Ray Charles. Man. So this is, are, are you in New York at this time when you did this recording? I'm, not, I'm living still in Fargo. In Fargo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had finished going to 
I didn't graduate from from Greeley, Colorado, northern northern Colorado, Greeley. I didn't graduate from there. Yeah, but I went for four years, and I got a lot of good help and information. Um, <clears throat> so when I sent out this tape, I was living in the basement, in my basement of the of our house, and uh, I don't know. I, I sent that out, and so. Um, and there was also a local band. This was really weird. There was, there was a band that was like, I don't know if it was like three people that were based in Minneapolis. Yeah. And they, they would do like, um, hotels. Uh, I can't remember what they were called, but like one of the gigs that one of the people had to be a trombone player. Oh. It was like drums, keyboards, and trombone. And you also had to sing. So they showed up in Fargo, and um, they and someone said, well, at the very least, you should, you know, like we told you we think you're good and that you might want this guy. And so... So then I... So then I had never really, like, sung... I mean, I... Did a lot of singing like most musicians do somewhere in their house or in their family, sure, yeah. church, whatever. Um, but I'd never really done it like in public. Um, so, but but I didn't. Yeah, I did have to. I did have to sing some sort of a tune. I can't even remember what I picked. But the, but they liked it enough and they offered me that job. Hmm. And so then and that would have happened like immediately. And uh, so was the Ray Charles thing. Like, well, I knew the Ray Charles thing was going to start. Theoretically, at a later date, um, and uh, so I took the chance of not accepting that, and I also took the chance of not accepting the Tommy Dorsey band. So um, wow, and and it turned out the way Ray ended up happening was, which was a you know pretty nice, nice thing was they had he would go like six months kind of like nonstop yep. tour every year. And then six months off, mostly. Although in that off period, maybe if something seemed like it was a good idea, easy enough to do, you would pop off for that. Yep. So in one of those things, one of those one-offs, um, I guess he probably figured, well, I kind of like this guy. Um, let's invite him to do this gig, see what he does. Um, and so I think it was in like Fort Lauderdale or someplace. I don't know, a warm place. And... and uh, um, they would normally, well, so like Ray, this was interesting. Ray never told the band what we were going to play. Hmm. He would send the list to the band director and he would tell us the list. Um, so, so there was like a band director conducting the, yeah, yeah, the, like, yeah, the lead out to like, oh, okay, I see. fantastic. He, he, yeah, he, he knew train and all the, all kinds of hip people. He wow. Was, um, we all like loved him deeply. Um, um, anyway, uh, so on that day, he was trying to guess what tunes we should rehearse. Cause he just didn't even know what was going to be on the, he didn't know. Show. Yeah. No one had told him and he was like, well, let's just try playing this one. So we played a couple things and we get out there and, and, um, and then they give us the list and I find all the tunes and I think the very first, and so the, Ray always started with just the band most people that hired him didn't know that and they sort of and 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 if you wanted the show to be longer it would just be more band yeah sure yeah <laughs> so his part of the show was always the same like 50 minutes or whatever it was yeah um and if you asked for more and, and you'd just get a lot more band yeah you know? sure <laughs> pretty clever <That's> awesome yeah. <laughs> um so whatever the first tune was I was playing the third trombone part, which was absolutely where I would have put myself, you know, if, if, <laughs> if somebody who doesn't really know totally what's going to happen. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> so, so anyway, it turned out to be like, is it, da, 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 do, 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 do. what's the name of that tune? Spain? Spain, yeah, Spain. Da, 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 Spain. So that's one. There was an arrangement of Spain. Yeah. And I'd heard it, but I never played it. I heard it a lot. I had Chick Corea records. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so like in the beginning playing the, that, that unison thing. And I, and I, and I was like, I totally know. And I played the crap out of it and I played it strongly and, and, and in the middle of me playing, that, or maybe when it was done, there was like, um, Ray 
stood up, aimed his face exactly at where I was, <laughs> and yelled, third trombone, too goddamn loud. Too goddamn loud. <laughs> and, and, and I, like fr- I kind of like just froze. <laughs> but then I realized, well, I guess I better... I guess I better just, you know, not play as loud. Yeah. <laughs> so, He's going to hear everything. That's so um, I did, and and um, and then nothing else weird happened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't. Good, and then I didn't really know what that meant. Like, like once that yeah. gig was over, like some people said some <clears throat> nice things, and I actually got to talk to a couple of them. They were super friendly and supportive and helpful. You know, like just talking about what might happen in the gig and whatever. I, I got a little bit of inside information from them, and they were happy to. You know, I guess because I didn't do any other than blink too loud i didn't do anything really stupid i guess yeah yeah and and but i had no idea somebody actually one of the, called me one it's maybe somebody in the trombone section hey are you going to do the tour i was like i don't know <laughs> yeah. like, they haven't told you and i was like no they haven't and, and am i supposed to ask <laughs> anyway so uh, i've um, been in that spot before yeah and it turned out that that uh they did accept me then for the tour which always started in la and and uh yeah it was a great great way to experience that kind of a thing you know so did you six months did you do a six months six months stress? yeah Ooh. and so like you know in the two years i did it two 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 tours i might have gone to like 18 different countries and like wow. 40 of the united states and oh, canada man. and brazil you know <laughs> like, amazing yeah yeah what well, like in fact the one and and there were two guys that were doing like equipment. They were beautiful brothers from Detroit, and and they were our equipment managers. And um, one of their jobs, and I didn't think about it at all until much much later, was to go into the audience and see people had these cameras, portable cameras to film stuff. Yeah, and they would just like rip out the film. Wow. <laughs> they would go and rip the film out, you know, because they understood, like, this is going to be a thing that might be worth money later, and they're yep. going to try and sell it, and we're not going to get it. And yep. That part, I didn't really understand that part, like, all that well, but there was one place uh, in Brazil where there's footage of me playing in the band um, just in the section for a couple seconds. You can see me. Um and then I went, well, I guess I'm kind of happy that I can see that. You yeah. Know? There's some, <laughs> some documented evidence yeah. of it. You can't really hear what I'm doing or anything like that, which is fine. It's not about me. But but you can see what a show with Ray was broadly like, you know. Yeah. Man. Yeah. And so, and so the craziest part of that whole tour was the most infamous part of it, the two years, was there was a play time when he fired the bass player just before a show. Yeah. Yeah. And then because my Fargo upbringing with all gigging with all these band director dudes and my dad, one of the things he would do if I was on the gig with him, this, and I, it's like my, it's just like super important and helpful. He would, he would say, well, you know, the guy that was playing drums, he's one of my dearest friends, but, you know, he tends to rush. And, um, and and I and he said, um, one thing you can do to sometimes keep a drummer from rushing is to go into two, which is always cornier, and it doesn't swing as hard. Yeah, but it helps corral <laughs> the tempo that they're trying to like you know change yeah um and so i was like i've never heard that that's interesting yep well i mean it it doesn't sound as hip i mean like you know if you're trying to play more modern jazz you're almost always playing for the bar you know although new orleans stuff is still sometimes too yeah and it grooves its butt off you know yep yep so so and i didn't know about like that i didn't know that much about that type of thing then yeah Uh, nothing like it was happening in fargo then so i didn't know about that um but uh yeah. So he fires the bass player. Then it turns out we he asks if there's a bass. And turns out one of the stage hands or something had a bass. Yeah. He hands me the bass. 
and the 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 the, the, uh, the organization owned a little Galen Kruger amp, a really nice little portable one. And so that was already there, and so I just had the bass, and I had the chord, and I go out, and I plug it in, and I kind of go like, ding, ding, ding. And, and as soon as the band leader sees that I'm making a sound through the bass amp, he goes, all right, here we go, one, two, one, two, three, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and the first band tune is Sister Sadie. Yeah. And it's a fairly, you know, moving tempo. And, um, and, the, and the greatest part of it all was, I don't know if that's what the key of that tune normally is, but it was in G. Is it, yeah, is G, in G? Bo, okay, bo, so that was good. Bo, so as a, as a guy that doesn't know if the bass is in tune, that's the best possible key. <laughs> yeah, there <laughs> because, you go. Because when I heard it, was like, this is not, this is like super flat. So, <laughs> so like I could go like G, 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 you know, like. So I did that in the middle of the tune. I tuned the freaking instrument. And then we get done with that. And then. So he's still, Ray had so many great big band arrangers work with him, all kinds of different people. Like Bob Brookmeyer wrote a lot of charts. Yeah. Um, I can't even remember everyone's name. Um, just like the top LA studio, beautiful, you know, people. And so um, there was a tune in the book that in the original version, Brookmeyer would play. Like Ray would just go chord, and then he would allow the trombone player to just like, mess around for a little bit and then i don't know whenever he felt like moving along you'd play the next chord and, and it was like just sort of, and there was nothing else happening it was like mm. him chord me playing trombone wow. you know and that happened like i don't know whenever we did that tune and it wasn't like uh he i because i think you know he just i'm guessing he liked the way i played it and and um and he would do this similar thing for other people that he felt like were strong soloists in the band uh, in the in the sax section. He tried to feature as many of them and the trumpets and everything. You know, cool. so there were lots of different you know chances for people to have a fairly decent spotlight. You know, in the band, he wasn't like a jerk about that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so I was so focused on what I was doing next, and I get the piece up and I'm and I'm and I I don't even know if it crossed my mind like this is the one I solo on on trombone you know because I was just like well I don't give it I mean like I'm what's the bass part you know? yeah, <laughs> yeah this is what I'm doing now you know and so all of a sudden I hear like chord further, further, further. <laughs> <laughs> and my and my beautiful roommate um fantastic human being um was a bass trombone player, lovely, lovely human. And he could play the book, but he couldn't really do much beyond that. And, yeah. and, and but he'd been bugging the, the so he started bugging all the remaining trombones that weren't me at, in that moment. It's like, let me play the solo. <laughs> <laughs> and and one of the guys in the band was mad at me because he had fixed it so he was getting lead bone pay without playing lead bone. Huh? Because he asked me if I wanted to play lead. I was like, I don't know. What do you? Why? Why are you asking me? He says, Well, I don't really want to play. Would you want to play lead? And I was like, Well, if you don't wanna, I'll be happy to do it. So I did, and I could. And, and, and did you know that there? I was had a, no idea there pay, was a pay discrepancy. Yes. <laughs> That's the whole point. And so I did like almost an entire tour without knowing that. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so 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 anyway, I'm. <laughs> I'm looking at my music, just like staring at it, trying to get a sense of what's going on, you know. And all of a sudden, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like, what? <laughs> and, and then the way it would work is, you know, Ray would play a chord and you'd play like a thing. And you weren't supposed to do like an opera or whatever, obviously. But um and it sort of seemed like he was trying to answer whatever it is you did in reason, you know. Like, I felt like that's kind of how it worked. Yep. And it was kind of really fun to be in that little just the two of us thing. Totally. A couple times. And um, so as soon as he heard this bad, bad play, he was like, next word, next word, next word. He went right through it super fast. <laughs> okay, we're out of there. <laughs> So I was just like I was I was thinking entirely about the bass and I was just like not really able to 
I would, <laughs> and then the third, what was the third thing? There was a third thing that happened in there. Um, oh, he decided to call, I think in the set, like he would sometimes do an audible, like whatever our list was, he would just say, well, I'm going to do this. And he would maybe play this thing. And so there was a tune, a beautiful ballad that he would sing. And it was just him on piano and the bass player. Hmm. And uh, luckily, um, I had played enough bass to be fairly confident. And um, and I had witnessed our excellent bass player who had left the band uh, a couple guys before this guy quit, you know, forcing me to be there in the chair. I watched him, and there was a spot where you had to hit a harmonic and bend the neck. Yeah. Which I didn't know you could do. But I saw how it was done because I was sitting in the trombone section and I could see him in front of the stage there doing that. So, yeah. So he called that just because he thought, well, let's see what this guy knows. Like, because we're playing tomorrow in Key West. <laughs> <laughs> and so we need to know, like, basically what Ray was, no, he wasn't telling me this, but what he was... What he was doing was we need to know if this guy could do the second gig and not just ruin everything. Yeah. And it looks like maybe he could. Because <laughs> I've just tested him on <laughs> several of the biggest hurdles, you know. So um, that is, that's what happened. Um, wow. So then when we went to Key West, they had a beautiful fretless bass. <laughs> <laughs> electric bass and I was like damn and then he called the one real solo for bass like with the band which was I Want Your Love like a disco tune hmm. and he would open like the Ray Letts would sing that kick it really really rock it um, and then they would that was where there was a bass and of course you're supposed to be slapping and popping but there's no there's no fret so you can't yeah so it just so, it just, so what I ended up doing is like just it sounded all boingy <laughs> I felt sort of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so then uh, he called me into the office afterwards and thanked me and gave me some denomination of bills. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I resisted the chance to say, "Gee, Ray, thanks, ten bucks." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if he'd appreciate that. But yeah, he right. might. He might have. <laughs> but I decided not to. Not to try that. Yeah. And then they got a, you know, real person. And so. you you went back to trombone and finished yeah. the tour? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's fun. So you, you've also played with some of my favorite bands in the world. You played with Maria Schneider's orchestra, and you played yeah. with John Hollenbeck, and, yep. of course, Fred Hirsch, who I... Did you just play with Fred again recently? Did you go Not back too again? recently, but I've played a couple different projects with him. I'm on... He, he did a... a project of the poetry of walt whitman and i'm on that cool um, and i think that's uh kurt elling is singing on that um and i can't remember if there's another there must be another singer i can't remember who it is yeah uh and then um the one that i really like was my coma dreams man he wrote a whole thing about it nearly dying and yeah. being in a coma and coming right. back out of it and learning how to walk and how to play the piano again and all that yeah that was it was like um trumpet tenor <clears throat> trombone and then like a string quartet i think hmm. um piano bass drums and with with an actor uh and a narrator i think yeah cool yeah and um and the way fred wrote it all the narration was so am amazing that he kept getting invited. He, I don't know if he's done doing it even yet, um, but many medical facilities asked him to come and present the work just because th he was a fairly well-known human in art who had come back from basically not being alive. I yeah. Guess, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, he, and, and he relearned how to, how to do that. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, how, so like, you, you finished with Ray. Did you move to New York right away? Yes. And then, like, you started getting connected. Like, I know that you spent time on Broadway doing yep. shows. Yep. And I knew like, one. I knew one guy. The guy from Fargo, North Dakota, uh, 
whose dad was the North Dakota State University band director yeah. and an excellent trombonist himself. He had given me a couple lessons, but he said, no, you should take lessons from my son, Bruce, who had gone to the New England Conservatory. Hmm. Um, and I think he had moved to New York that already. So he, so when, by the time I did, I knew that guy. I knew one guy there. And um, um, actually, uh, other than that, probably nobody else. But, but, but uh, um, he helped explain how it worked. And uh, the very first time, I mean, because I was, you know, an idiot in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still capable of being an idiot. But, um, <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> but, but he introduced me to one of the busiest trombonists, Jack Schatz, who played all kinds of stuff, like commercial stuff, shows recordings you know mm -hmm. uh and um and and classical he's a classical guy um and when they said something like you know broadway show and i said well who would want to play a show like you keep playing this stuff all the time and, and they just laughed and and <laughs> and, and then, then then that's when i later figured out that yeah well that's one of the best paying gigs in, in town if you're if you're trying to like eat based on your ability to play yeah that's one of the things that could really work for you and so i happened to hit town when the, i almost played a show literally sight reading it because the old school people that liked me enough to th th invite me to possibly play the show they wanted me to sight read the show hmm. and i always thought i was pretty good at sight reading but by the time and they asked me if i was and i was like yeah i'd like to do it and it turns out um that the show actually closed before the day when i was going to do that oh interesting <laughs> <laughs> and i said well can i can coming. i get, can i get it into the pit and at least like stare at the music or something you know like like is it okay uh, and they were like uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> because because that must have been like the new york vibe and maybe it wasn't like that in la i don't really know that much about yeah. that but like you know that people that can sight read that was like a like a real badge of honor you know yeah. and i felt like i'd been taught toward that end and i thought i was really pretty good at it too um but by the time i started getting into shows everyone was saying bring your portable cassette recorder record the whole show here's copy of the music yeah because they figured like they finally like realized it would be easier on all of us and you know like many more people could work in this industry at least a tiny bit yep. which would save their asses and they wouldn't need to leave leave town you know yeah and and um and then students that i've taught and loved you know i could have them help out on the show you know and i could right. do like you know i don't have to like wonder if you're you know <laughs> but i read something so so yeah, yeah. Uh, and so then i was able to do it and i just you know practiced it a billion times and listened to it a zillion times and um, and when I went and when I finally played a show for the first time, a relatively crabby bass trombonist, like a beautiful human and an amazing musician and all that. And we later became friends, I think. And, um, uh, he said, that's the best first show I've ever heard anybody play. Wow. And, 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 and well, and I, and it took me a while to understand that it wasn't like that I was a genius. It was partly because anybody should be able to play the show after you know getting to research at them I mean, like that's what that's what classical people do there with their whole lives is they keep playing the same excerpts over and over and over right. and over again like you know petrushka yeah mm -hmm. i mean yep. <laughs> nobody's played that many times <laughs> you know like it's it's yeah yeah you 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 have to because it's not really logical or normal compared to like what a tr trumpet does you know yeah yep. it's a lot everything about it is weird you have to stay on top of it um so then that turned into a 23 24 year yeah. how many year career in, in yeah, on I think Broadway? It, I think it was 23 23 years. Yeah. I um when I was updating my I don't know CV or whatever a while ago I learned I had never counted my although my buddy Bruce Item he counted actual shows. Yeah. So Individual he's like shows. he's like yeah um 12,000 shows or something I mean oh, like geez. you know <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I could never do that. I would never want to know. Yeah, how many? <laughs> but he's he's really into it. He he he's still counting. 
Wow. <laughs> so I, I don't know what the number of it is, but I think it's over 10,000 for sure. So did you did you grow to like doing that? Because like yeah, I've done totally. some shows myself totally. and like did, you know, it's like it, it was all right. It was nice to ha- have like a steady check. You know, like I felt like, yeah, this is cool. I was working at the Children's Theater in Minneapolis and did it. Uh, did some subbing at the Guthrie and, yeah. you know, did a show at another theater. And, you know, it's like I generally played shows that had jazz stuff in them. Yep. Because that's what people knew me as. But mm-hmm. I still would feel like my soul was getting sucked away over, yes. over the course of many weeks, you know, yes. when it became like these long run shows. It got tough to like continue to go down there yeah you know dressing all black it's like you're not it's like you stop kind of i don't know for me it was like you're not in front of the audience so you're like you're not i'm not i wasn't taking care of myself in the same way i'm not like looking how i usually look when i go out and play mm-hmm. and so i i don't know that i liked that you know and it's like it was nice to get the bag but it was like yeah i wanted to be playing yep jazz shows and you you got to do that in new york so were you subbing out broadway shows when you got an opportunity to play with say like maria or something like that totally yeah yeah no, that's um, wow. Uh, one one of the one of the things I didn't understand very well at all. So this this mentor of mine, Bruce Item, who who was der- doing some of the shows, and that's where on a show that he was in, that's the first place I I subbed and was successful. Hmm. Um, um, shoot, what was I saying? <laughs> um, I was talking about not. I was talking about subbing out gigs. And- oh yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that um, I went to the Manhattan School of Music um, in, in for this reason. Um, my buddy Bruce Item was going there to work on his master's degree, mm-hmm. um, and I don't know if he f- hoped he could get a college job or if he just wanted to become a better player or, or meet some people. I don't really know. Uh, why why he went there um because i ended up getting a doctorate later but but like i didn't know i was going to do that either but but and and at manhattan manhattan and maybe it's the same at juilliard and other really big schools around there um but manhattan had a great liberal policy which is like hey if you could call for a gig take the gig and get somebody to sub on your school orchestra seat yeah do that you need to learn know how to do this yeah and so and so he started getting calls to do paying gigs, you know, um, and uh, and he called me for all of those gigs because he knew I wasn't doing anything and he knew that I kind of knew something about what I was doing. Yeah, cool. And, and that I wasn't probably going to do anything stupid and ruin, ruin any of that, you know. Um, so I, I just was constantly there in the Manhattan School of Music. And one day, well, the trombone professor who was playing in the Metropolitan Opera, he's like, I see you all the time. <laughs> like, are 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 you in? Are you uh, you know getting a degree here? I was like, no, I'm just filling in for for my buddy Bruce all the time. And he plays in all you know. He plays in the orchestra, he plays in the jazz band, he plays in the brass quintet or whatever. Like all you know, he, maybe we even had a wind ensemble. I can't remember, but he played you know and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and he was like, huh. <laughs> so so <laughs> so then he said. Um, um well do you have a a bachelor's degree i said yeah i do and he said uh are you interested in getting a master's degree i said i don't know you know (laughs) never i never thought about it (laughs) and he said well if i told you it would be free would you be interested in it i was like yes yes there you go nice (laughs) so so that's what happened there those became like your auditions almost like going and sitting in those bands and they got to hear you play and go like this guy can really do it yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So I got a master's degree. And that and I, you know, I learned and so the, the th- and the thing, the one that it's like almost the tiniest thing, but it turned out to be like I wouldn't say like it changed my path in a huge way, but it helped so much more than like what it felt like. Um this this teacher was a really lovely human. He wasn't in maybe the greatest shape when I encountered him. Yeah. And when he would try and demonstrate something, it didn't actually sound all that amazing. Mm. And he didn't really address it. Um, and I don't know if he would had a debilitating condition. I don't really know about it. But but we were both, I think, nice to each other. 
about all that stuff. And so the one thing that he pointed out to me, it's like the smallest. He, he told me, you are not yet, you've never in my presence made of what we would call a classical attack of a note. Ah. Like I was such a jazz brain. Yeah. Um, wanting to like make everything connect and slur and um and when I was doing that I thought the kind of like D sound I was using with you know my tongue instead of the t- yep the crisp t- you know and I knew about the the T I just had been so much jazz and commercial yep. um I kind of like didn't remember it or you know so he 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 reminded me you know, yeah like, you need to be able to do this to play in a brass quintet or an orchestra or and i was like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> and and so kind of like just from that really great observation i became viable to kind of classical things and so one of the more fun gigs i ever ended up doing was playing on a in a baroque orchestra they were playing at a430 hmm. and they had like bassoons that only had like three keys on them wow <laughs> trumpets that didn't have any keys on them. yeah yeah holes you know Just the clarion holes yeah <laughs> yep cool and and we played old music that was meant to be played at like a 430 and um and i ended up getting an old trombone um so were those instruments all purposefully to- tuned to a 430 rather than what's they, typical they, now a well they were because I've never understood this. Like I, I really want to research it someday. I don't. I still don't understand why we picked 440 or whatever the number was. Yeah. Like, like you know, I don't know if somebody said like, well, at the end of the Geneva Convention when they were trying to like just take care of everything so they could get the hell out of there, it's like, what about what about pitch? And uh-huh. people just started saying 412, 418, 4, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> it's like 440. We're out of here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Arbitrary. Well, yeah, yeah. It seems like it had to have been. Yeah. What, what else could it possibly have been? And and and. And uh, so those, uh, and and when I went home to visit my dad, he ended up with these three old trombones, and they were all old enough to be A430. So I just picked the least crappy one, and I brought it back to New York. And when I was in a pit mentioning this, there was a horn player who said, did you say it has two tuning slides? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like what a weird what a weird thing to like over here and yeah. ask about <laughs> yes <laughs> wow uh, and i said yes it does <laughs> she said well i have some gigs for you wow because she knew she liked the way i behaved and played and she knew that means he has a horn that can play in at a430 and it won't be like you know ruining it or anything yep. like, it'll, it'll feel comfortable and so then then here out of the blue I'm playing, it's not, it's not a big orchestra, but it's an orchestra. And everyone, like even the string players, like this is from the 1500s, this bass. You wow. Know, or whatever. <laughs> and it's just like, and, and it, it's so, it was so interesting. Like all of a sudden you're hearing orchestral sounds, but they're not as, I don't know, edgy. And they just seem more mellow and like blended together. Mm-hmm. And nobody's hurting themselves. Like man, in, a, in the New York Philharmonic trombone section, they might have like deafened some people permanently, you know. They're sure. playing like really, really strong. Yep. I don't know whose idea that was. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody <laughs> stopped them from doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not gonna even begin to insinuate that they weren't amazing, amazing players. Yeah. Just that. In retrospect, I was like, I don't know that I'd want to be in something that was working that hard to play. Yep. Really, really, really loud. Yeah. You know? Like, like, yeah. So, yep. Um, and then when I was in Ray's band, a couple of the members were like, you ever play salsa? And I was like, I don't know. What's that? What? You know? <laughs> <laughs> And so, so they, they said, we're taking you to, and so they took me to a record store in East LA and they, we just walked through the aisles and they go like, here, 
they just handed me LPs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just bought like, you know, eight of them or whatever it was. And, and then I had to ship. So what was it? Like Indestructible and stuff like it, Ray Barreto? It, um, it's, there might have been some of that, but I definitely remember Willie Colon yep. and Afania All Stars. And um, uh, I haven't th- thought of those records in a long time now, but, but uh, shoot. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, man. And then. Mario Bausa, hmm. um, I got to play with him cool. a couple of times. I mean, hmm. you know, I don't know. I don't know how. I mean, I know Bruce Item ended up playing with them, and he sent me as a sub, and they liked me as a sub, and so then, so then I got to do it, um, couple, you know, live several times with Cecilia Cruz. Um, is that her name? The singer. One of the just to like to like the Ella Fitzgerald of salsa singing. Yeah, yeah, interesting. yeah. No, I and and um, but thankfully for those band members that introduced me to the idea of salsa and like what it was, I had enough of an idea. It turns out that the first apartment we lived in was like a block away from a salsa school. Cool. Or, or like a larger building, one of the rooms was a salsa school. Yeah. And so when they found out this guy doesn't have any work and he lives like <laughs> down the street, call him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was a guy who had been a, I think he had tried to play and he definitely tried to play salsa and, you know, Latin stuff. Um, and he had been a music educator in like middle schools. And he had done that like three blocks away from where we happened to live. Yeah. Um, some would say like slightly past the border of Spanish Harlem. I don't know. Whatever. We didn't think about it. Yeah. And there weren't really any super creepy events or anything like that. Um, and so he would hold like a a brass choir. He bought all the Robert King books, which are brilliant, like beginner-ish, beautiful music. It's mostly pretty really old music. But he would write it out so that, you know, you could have trumpets and horns and flugelhorns and euphoniums and tubas, you know. So, like, and he would just try and get as many people in there. Like, and maybe one day it was only going to be octets and then it'll be 16 parts next week or whatever, you know. And so you would meet a whole bunch of people. And it was not competitive. You were just playing for fun. Yeah. Yep. And so um, I was always, re- that the way I, you know, in Fargo, it made me think I will do that pretty much any time like i'm not at all turning you down because you're not paying me i mean if it sounds like like it might be interesting to play i would love to try it yeah you know, whatever it is and that did do you feel like that philosophy led to you working in tons of yes. things and getting yeah. paid eventually yeah. And, yeah 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 absolutely yeah and that uh, yep yep yeah um and and some of the people uh were clearly not operating with that idea like yeah. they were laser focused on a certain thing and didn't probably i don't know that most of those people were very happy you know sure um like my fi- one of my favorite humans of all time is scott robinson this guy mm-hmm. and i met him doing a horrible fourth of july parade with an awful band and a really angry <laughs> leader <laughs> and later on somebody said I think he was part of the uh, Mussolini brown shirts or something jeez <laughs> jeez I don't know New Jersey you know yeah. <laughs> so, um, and so I'm playing and then there's a guy I was uh, he, we had these mar- marching, you know, liars, and we had the parts, and I'm, I'm playing. And behind me, I'm just hearing all these amazing <laughs> sounds. And it turns out it's Scott Robinson playing the bass saxophone. He's wow. just playing the shit. <laughs> the <laughs> <bitch>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, my God, man. This is amazing. Um, and then there's a trombone player that's trying to blow over everything and not not doing a good job. <laughs> yep. and then um this is my favorite part we're done we're definitely done we move in five rank and file not at, you know not really probably even in step but we get to the uh football field where the fireworks are going to happen or whatever and and um i don't know there's a lull and nothing's happening and then the, this angry little Mussolini guy. <laughs> he's like, let's, let's play. We got to play now. There's nothing's happening. And he's like, okay, well, let's do the Stars and Stripes forever. And, and he just starts like waving. 
<laughs> and and I think what all of us, or at least most of us, did was, what's going to happen at the dogfight? How does that go? What are those notes? What are those intervals? Yeah. <laughs> none of us know what those are. <laughs> it's going to be a shit show. <laughs> and so none of us played a note. Like, without speaking to each other, it was like, it's like I no, can see where that's going to go. We're let's, not going to do that. Let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he's waving his arms. <laughs> Nobody's playing. It's awesome. Because we all just said, "Yeah, that that can't possibly." You know, internally we said that can't possibly work, and yeah, so we shut it down. So that <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my earliest gigs. You know, <laughs> let's do <doing> that. <laughs> yep. No, there were a lot of great kind of weird mishaps like that. So, did you end up uh, working with Scott after that? Like, you not immediately. Um, but when, when I did, I just kept thinking, like he played in Maria's band. Oh, he probably still is in Maria's band. He's been in there the entire time. And like when he would play, I would just go like, and, um, I don't know how exactly I felt like I got to know him better. Um, there's a guitar player named James Trillo who kind of lived near where Scott did. And when he found out that I wasn't that far from there, sometimes we would end up like at a party that Scott would host. And then people might try and play a little bit after that. And, you know, that might have been how I first might have played with him was in a party. Yeah. I don't know. Or maybe he subbed. I had a regular Friday night gig in it with a really bad um, traditional jazz band. They were all amateurs that, that started the band. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple of people that kind of knew more about what they were doing. And maybe Scott played that because he he's, was that kind of guy. Like he would play almost with any anybody in in any circumstance just because what what you know what could it hurt i guess yeah <laughs> so maybe um so yeah. is he how you got connected with maria is that no i th- not, so, so the way i got com- so maria like when she started her band she was at um a brazilian nightclub hmm. that was the vibe the people that owned it were from Brazil. Interesting. And, and that was co- and that was a co-led band, right? Her, like her early iteration? With like Fedchok. Okay. Yeah. And then, but by the time I inc- encountered it, it was just her. Okay. I didn't, I never was there for the Fedchok part. Mm. Um, and the only reason I think I got in as a sub is because um, George Flynn bass trombone player, and, uh, man, one of the great, Keith O'Quinn. Those two people, I subbed on shows with them. Hmm. Okay. I wouldn't have thought of it like that, but in retrospect, it's it's easier to understand that now. Yeah. Um, they just like, well, this guy can read, and he knows how to play in tune and in a section, and he's probably not doing anything stupid, and he's definitely not going to ask, to play a solo, yeah. you know? <laughs> I mean, we don't know if he can, but, like, you know, he's not that dumb, you yeah. know? Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so um, but there is a recording of you soloing with Maria's band. Is there? There's a live, yeah, you, t- you take a solo, I don't remember what tune, but there's a live recording that's on YouTube, and it's just like a still picture, hmm. and you're in the band, oh. and then she's on the mic, she says your name, and... oh. You take a solo. Right. I played it for our jazz history classes. I was showing them a bunch of Maria stuff. <laughs> and I, I found it and I thought, I got to show them this because it's Mike. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, she she uh, has always been like a fantastic human being. And, and uh, so it was really a pleasure to go there. And, and, and so one of the guys in her band, um, Rock Cicerone. Hmm. He was the one trombone player I encountered who could deal with giant steps at the normal tempo, yep. pretty, pretty much. And it was amazing. Um, and I think she had a chart on it, and he would often get to play on it. I mean, and so would a bunch of other people, too. Cool. Um, and he ended up playing the Lion King, mm. which is now run for like 30 years. Forever, yeah. So I don't know when he started. I, I know he wasn't there at the beginning. And then George Flynn, who was also in Marie's band, one of the top bass trombonists in town, he had been playing The Lion King. He finally bailed. Um, then I started subbing for the guy that uh, on the bass trombone tuba chair. Um, and uh, that was actually pretty pleasant. 
Um, but I think Rock had trouble, you know, like once he wasn't in Maria's band, I don't know what else he had to do, you know. Yep. And, and certainly the fact that he could really deal with Giant Steps was an amazing thing, but I don't know. Uh, I always liked him. I mean, he's still he's still around. I would I, I'm pretty sure. I think he's still alive. And um, but it just it just sort of showed I don't know how weird it all could be. You know that yep. some, somebody somebody that does like one of the harder things you can possibly imagine doesn't get credit for it because it's not actually needed that often. You know. Yeah, I, I was just saying like on this podcast yesterday, like man. It's far more like there's all these other things that are non musical that are as important, yeah, you know, or yeah. in times more important than being a really impressive soloist or like a really impressive technician. Yeah. You know, it's like just being a good hang, being reliable, answering yeah. your phone, yeah. like all these basic things yeah. that are really important to making a career. Yep. It's like you don't have to be the one that can burn over giant steps. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. Reliable, solid player, good readers, like all these things that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, are you willing to tune to somebody else in the middle of a, a chord, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> Just tiny little things like that. All that. <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. So what? Ha- how did uh, John Hollenbeck's band uh, come together? Uh, wow, I wish I could be positive about that. Let me think. Let me think. Um, I don't know. Uh, that is an excellent question. <laughs> uh, oh, the f- there's two reasons, um, and they're weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we played with Fred Hirsch and the first project, when I when I was part of that, um, John Holmbeck was the drummer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. He he was. He w- he tried to use John, I think, all the time for that particular stuff. And um, so one of the places we played on tour with Ray's band was in Rochester at, like, right near um, Eastman, you know? Yep. And, um, and so, like any good musical college, when they heard Ray's band was in town, they're like, let's invite him over to jam at our like frat house or whatever. So, so we were invited and I went down and played and, um, <laughs> and I happened to just like, I think I went over to John and said, man, you sound amazing. Great. You know, hope to, hope to see you, you know, somewhere down the road or whatever. And, and, um, and I don't know if this is when we had just gotten back from a tour and I had, one of the places we went was Istanbul, Tur- Turkey. Yeah. And we went to the Istanbul factory. The drummer in our band knew a, an, a, an American that had been living in Turkey for a billion years and was a great jazz drummer himself. And so he, he contacted that guy, and we squeezed into a Fiat or something and drove <laughs> way, way out what seemed like in the middle of nowhere. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, you're good. Middle of nowhere. And... and um, and we stopped at what looked just like a house. It looked exactly like somebody's house. It didn't look at any like kind of a factory of any type. And when you went in, there was nothing in there except like super hot, fiery thing, you know, places to melt metal, I guess. And, wow. and then places to stash the symbols that were made and hammers and, you know, tools. Yeah. So there were so like hand making symbols. Totally. In that little house. And, and, and so the, the drummer. Um, goes up to the his buddy who knows how to translate, and he said, "Okay, so the first thing I'm looking for is like a like a ride symbol that's like really dry, um, and has I don't know if you wanted overtones or less overtones or whatever. He he you know described it like with a fair amount of detail, mm-hmm. and then that that American expatriate drummer says all that in Turkish to." One of the guys is like, okay, and so he goes, <laughs> he goes over, and and it's like it's like this. He, he, I mean, except there's not a, it's just a symbol, and there's a rack, and he just goes like, 
this one, no, not that one. Like since he hand hammered them all, he's like, okay, not this one. Yeah, that's not. It didn't quite go there or whatever. This one maybe, and then and then when he and when he thinks he's got the the mixture, he takes it out and he hands it to our drummer, and he puts it on the stand and he just hits hits it like and he goes like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know or whatever <laughs> and then he plays the other one and it's basically the same like you know like as beautiful maybe slightly different or whatever and then he, he and he does that a couple of times yeah he does it with a, with a pair of hats and he does it with i don't know if he got a kind of a more of a crash thing i'm not quite sure but you know he just that's that's how it worked and i just took the runners up so like like the one he really liked he's like here's the second place one and i was like i'll take that one yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i got i i had bought a, a whole set of symbols i got i got the uh, hi-hats and i got ride uh, a ride and a maybe two rides or a crash rider one was a crash i don't know whatever they are and i still have them and so wow. when and th- and shortly after this happened and when i put them all in a box in a different we went to in a naval base in turkey uh, Izmir, I think was the name of it. And I put all these into a cardboard box and shipped it by boat to my mom's house in North Dakota. And I wow. knew that was going to take months, but I wasn't going to be home for months. So yeah, I, it know. didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, when I got off the road, I was like, symbols? Here they are. Yeah, cool. <laughs> you know? But but so, uh, yeah. Um, when I was telling this to John Holland back at Eastman, he's like, What? <laughs> <laughs> you you went to Turkey and bought symbols. Yeah. Why did you do that? <laughs> I said, well, um, I you know sometimes live in remote locations where you know if you want to play music, you should play a bunch of different instruments. It's kind of how I was growing up, growing up, or at least you know function. And I said, also, I was told these are some of the best symbols in the world, and this is the cheapest way to get them and yeah, so I'm gonna, since i was there i was like i'm not gonna pass up that opportunity and and he, <laughs> and he just like i can't I've, i like you know i definitely confused him and so maybe yeah. he thought of me and remembered me because of that so yeah then, that's interesting so, yeah. so when we met again in fred hirsch's he and and i kind of said do you remember like and he's like you're not that guy and i said i am that guy <laughs> but i'm like 20 years older and much fatter yes. than you remember me. <laughs> I, was, I was very skinny when I was with Ray. <laughs> he's like, uh, <laughs> but he finally, he finally bought it. He finally bought it. And then I, you know, showed him the symbols, of course. And, and yep. um, it's like, oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> and so, awesome. so, yeah, I don't know if, I'm sure that's not like necessarily why he, why he called me but it was i I would i have always imagined that the reason people called me is they thought there's probably not gonna be any drama he's probably not gonna ruin anything um yeah he'll definitely be listening and not probably saying anything (laughs) 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 you know um you know one and, and and one of the things like that i didn't say out loud once which i hoped was an example of so like i don't know what it's like now but at a certain point, people started having tuning devices in the pit. Yep. Which, you know, can't blame them. They can be useful. Um, but when I went into sub one time on a book that was bass trombone and tuba, I was seated next to someone that played the baritone sax and, I don't know, maybe a couple more woodwind instruments, low wind, maybe. Um, anyway... And when I saw the clip on, uh, what's it called? The thing that tells you whether you're a tuner. Tuner, tuner. yeah. Clip, um, clip on tuners. Yeah. I, I started thinking to myself, is that for me or the person? <laughs> is that is the person that's sitting next to me? Is that part of their vibe? Um, yeah, and I just kind of thought like, now I'm starting to be a little bit nervous about, you know, music industry a little bit. You know, <laughs> like I just, sure. I just you know. Like, well, it's interesting too because like <laughs> I, I know band directors who will they'll go player to player, yeah, and they'll show them a, on a tablet 
Mm-hmm. And they'll go, is it, is it a smiley face? Is it a smiley face? And I'm like, we're not really teaching our students how yeah. to listen yeah. and copy sound, right. which is really what tuning should be about. <laughs> we're just look. We're, we're teaching them how to like visually see that they're out of tune, which is doesn't help with yep. music. You know. I'm yeah, not, and and a big part of tuning is balance. Yeah, you can pretty much not tune if you're not balanced generally. And yeah, yeah, that's one 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 of my most fond memories was really like basic. Um, Ed Hickus, who used to be in um, Thad Jones's band playing Barry Sax. He, he, he was one of those beautiful guys that just loved, loved, loved playing. And even when he wasn't really working, when he was older and probably not, like, gigging all that often, he would show up at the Musicians' Union, like, big band, all in, whoever wants to play and, you know, whatever. And um, so I would do that, too. Um, or maybe we were doing, like, the BMI Composers Workshop or something. You know, that yep, like, yep. wasn't no one was getting paid, but we were doing it because mm. it sounded like it would be fun. And, and so I was playing bass trombone, and I don't, you know, the bass trombone... <laughs> I ended up playing it because everyone suggested I should play it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I and I didn't know I was going to like it and I certainly didn't like it much at all at the beginning, but then as I got better at it I I liked it okay and, and I came to grips with it, you know. Um but anyway, one day he's in the front row playing Barry and I'm in behind him playing um bass trombone. And we play this tune or a lick or chunk of music or something and he turns around and he goes he hit me hit me in the (laughs) slap my knee and what he meant was you know (laughs) yeah like like like, and 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 um without talking i think he understood that what i was trying to do was get my sound inside of his sound and that it happened and he heard it. Yeah, cool. Really cool. <laughs> it's a little like <laughs> how to how to how to be in a band in a nutshell right there. Yeah, like and, and when, when uh Fred did his thing with the string quartet, um what he wrote for the trombone part was kind of like pretty simple, which is beautiful. I I've never been offended by any of that. Um and so he would sometimes say, you know, could you play a little louder? And 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 I, I don't know if I answered him or just tried to avoid answering him because what I wanted to do was I wanted to fold my sound into the cello. Mm-hmm. And um, and maybe I said that to him. I'm not sure. Uh, but, I you know, that's that's a a thing that's hard to even describe. You know, how yep. you can take any two instruments and if if the balance is right, you get a completely different unthought of sound that maybe no one's ever or even heard, you know. Yeah, that's cool. And and you can tell, you can feel it that that, you know, like it's it's pretty amazing, all that. Yeah, man. Well hey, I think that's a, a nice place to put a bow on it. Appreciate you taking the time to Tell me some stories, man. It's always <laughs> awesome. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Mike Christensen. If you're digging the podcast, please like and subscribe and comment wherever you're listening. If you could write a review of the show on something like Apple Podcasts, that really helps us out. Positive reviews helps it show up into other people's feeds, which will help us grow and help us continue to get great and high-profile guests. We've got an app called Gig Boss. That's an organizational tool for freelance musicians and band leaders. You can create groups, you can create events, and you can track all the details. There's lots of awesome features being added every month, and it's getting a little prettier too, which is exciting. So check that out. It's totally free on iOS and Android. There's a download link in the description. We've got a Spotify playlist of all the artists who've been on the show, so you can listen to their music. And there's a Gig Boss Facebook page where we sort of digest the episodes. We talk about music industry-related and artistry-related things. I post outlandish stuff to spark conversations. It's great. Head over there and check that out as well. Thanks for listening. Appreciate you.